Welcome everyone to the first attempt with this AMD 386 challenge. On the data center, which is somewhere like here. So on the data center I used my T2 trunk that I had already partially downgraded for the Spark32 build. Theoretically I could even make some vintage computing branch with some downgraded GCC Linux kernel version and so on. And I compiled a similar base system like for the Spark32 with GCC 4.2 and Linux kernel 3. Point something. I rsynced the resulting ISO file. I did not build everything, some pieces are missing um, that I don't care right now. Well, some things could build that I only skipped due to incidents. Um, well, TSET data only conflicts with all glibc, it doesn't really matter. Um, package config um, depends on glib which wants some atomic instruction or something, so probably to have a full build I would have to down date glib also. And graph only fails due to not having built a C++ in that library, which is the same reason something else failed here. What was it? Smart non tools. Most things build and I cannot even pretest if this would have a chance to work because QAMO i386 does not even have a 386 emulation. Uh, or does it? At least the system emulation does not... Why does it not throw a warning? Because the system emulation also only has 486. Maybe I should the next weekend also have a project to see if it's possible to get 386 in QMO also. Maybe by simply reducing the 486 model further. So why does this not warn? 386... Oops, what was it? Ah, this... Phantom touches... <coughs> And um, so 386 libc, yeah, unable to find CPU definition. So, wait, but 486 causes an illegal instruction. How is it possible? Yeah. I think it's loading the, I think the other one, the first invocation may have used the system libc, which obviously has 686 and AMD 64 versions. So 486 and the loader that works and libc lets the loader loads libc that works also. This by the way is now Linux threads, not NPTL native POSIX threads like actually supported on the Spark 32 bit because the glibc never had NPTL native POSIX threads with this atomic instructions for 386. So I had to go as far back as glibc. 236 probably was one of the very last where this old fashioned Linux threads was available. So, yeah, this is extremely vintage, unfortunately. Yeah, I wonder if it would be possible to hack some non atomic but placeholder instructions to use on non SMP systems, the newer GLIPC versions. To shorten the installation time, I certainly do not want to unpack, especially since we are using set standard, which requires more memory. This would probably be quite some fail on this. Uh, while excessive swapping anyway on this lovely 386. So I'm using QAMO, but as a user emulation, the oldest CPU model is 486 likewise, so I cannot yet be sure if this will actually boot. So this is a only 4 gigabyte Seagate, which even has a jumper to limit it to, I don't know, 2 megabyte or something. Um, and it had some Fedora test install from a decade ago. I actually had the 386 um, board loading grub and trying to load Linux, but then it simply rebooted. Probably the decade old Fedora kernel was not mentally prepared for real 386 uh, without any of this instructions that 486 brought. As the IDE cable that I had here had this coding here, this closed pin to avoid plugging it in 180 degree reversed, which I actually prefer. I really hate when such kind of cables are not coded. However, this vintage board was not coded, so I pressed down a pin for now. I usually prefer the safe route and um, test it first before I really cut it to avoid accidentally cutting off by one and then um, better safe than sorry and uh, not sit here with a soldering iron soldering a new pin in there. So yeah, next I will cut it, but this works. Let's see how the install system will go in some minutes. Actually, I just went to the German Conrad electronics store around the corner. This is not a paid advertisement. No affiliation with them uh, whatsoever. If someone at Conrad wants to sponsor this video, they are free to contact us. Because I brought here some CR2032 battery holders. Uh, six or so because I probably need at least one for the Spark Station 2 for the Ultra 5. Uh, theoretically maybe another Sun uh, you will see. And the 386 and 
maybe eventually for the SG Octane. So I brought six of these to glue and solder to the NVRAM. And those batteries are usually in Germany not that cheap, as cheap skate as I am. I only wanted to buy one. But then I found this uh, five for the price for two and a half or so in some corner sale area. Lucky to score this for the or for all the NVRAM soldering the coming weeks. First I want to see if this has a chance to work um, and also if I destroy the board with soldering I have nothing for you to show anymore so obviously it makes more sense to do the testing first and the soldering later. By the way this is also a little bit annoying here for me to edit so we have 2018 and this I tried a moment ago, I think I used 49. This are this funny predefined old-fashioned uh, DOS things where it's like hard disk type 6 or something. But we need to use, um, it even shows in the help here, uh, if you don't find your disk, use 48 or 49, which lets you select. I wonder why are there two different, why are there 48 and 49, but whatever. So we have 8800. 8,894 and 60, 15 hats and 63. Sectors has here by the way a second area where you could tweak this awesome. Oh, you can change your cast timing, interesting. So exit is 10, save is 5. Honestly, the first try. So I installed this freshly compiled 386 Linux in QEMU to save me the pain of connecting a CD-ROM and waiting half a day of the installation, decompression and such. Yes, I know this already. Uh, what is it if I want to continue? Um, certainly my time is better spent doing interesting things than watching 386 booting enormously slow from a CD-ROM. So what is happening? Nothing. But uh, this is interesting. At least it tried to load here the MBR. Most likely the BIOS can probably not address the sectors, I guess, unfortunately, huh? some gigabyte something limitation. Yeah, what was it? Was it a two gigabyte limitation or what was in earlier times? So I probably have to create a boot partition and try again, but at least crop tries to do something. IDE drive is connected there. I can reset this. A reset is reset switch. So this should probably work. That you really believe me, that's a 386. However, we will, with this, not yet, by the way, this is from 93. In the meantime, I also found there is some Peacock sticker, so this is probably from some pre-configured Peacock system. Maybe uh, it would have already worked the first time. By the way, this pause is, I guess, a decompression of the um, graphic or something. This uh, garbled graphic there was already in QEMO, so this is not related to running on real hardware. So either this is a generic GCC issue or really something i386 compiling related. I already know this will not work because the init RD is for sure way too large. I think maybe 5 megabyte or something. Maybe we do it two steps just to test loading the kernel. But this will panic without mounting the root file system anyway, if it's going that far. No, it hmm. just reboots, but certainly this was not enough memory. I hoped I would at least get to kernel panic regarding not being able to mount the root file system, but okay, investigation continues. A little bit of uh, progress. For a test I booted an over decade old Slackware kernel, because I guess with Rocklinux NT2 I probably never built a 386 kernel, as we usually optimize more for latest and greatest CPUs. So this is some 2.2.19 built with GCC 2.95.3 in 2001. And this indeed boots. Apparently also my FPU is working. Here's some checking 386, 387 coupling. Okay, FPU using old IOQ 13 error reporting. Interestingly there is checking for pop AD bug. Buggy. Did not even remember that pop AD was buggy sometime. Little Google this for the fun of it. A little progress. The first self-compiled kernels for 386 did not boot at all. They would just reboot really quickly when loaded from Grub. Then I booted the very old Slackware kernel that I found and that indeed booted, obviously also until the kernel panic not being able to mount the root file system, but that was unrelated. Anyway, I went slightly more back with Linux kernels and so 2630, by this at least decompressed the kernel and started to boot. 
It kernel panicked and first I could not see so much information so I booted with VGA equals ask and I set the text mode to some VGA 80 by 60 text mode so that it is 80 by 80 characters and I get twice as much text. The real bug appears to be uh, unable to handle kernel null pointer dereference at 134. So now we need to take a look at this or simply slightly go back further with Linux kernels. According to the call trace this is an identifier boot CPU which certainly makes sense given that we boot a very vintage 386 at Certainly, according to all the kernels not being able to boot anyway, few people tried in the last decade. So this is in start kernel, checkbox, identify boot CPU, and this apparently tries to dereference a null pointer. Maybe I simply boot slightly older kernels to see if I'm lucky and this goes away. But one thing for sure, if we really want to eventually boot the latest 3 point something kernel before 386 support was removed, we certainly have quite some bugs to fix because the newer kernel would not show any text at all. They would simply reboot very quickly for not yet determined reasons. Memory wise, so we have 5.6 available from 8.4 and 1.3 megabyte kernel code, 2.3 reserved and some data and so on. One thing for sure, booting with original 4 megabyte I had in there before installed additional memory will be extremely challenging. Probably do something more useful and funny like debugging some SPDIF output on some Macs or something or finishing the P3 graphic acceleration stuff but um, with 8 megabyte it should work just that we need to find out what was broken there with the CPU identification stuff there. And I also got the historically more matching ET3000 card working simply by lifting the socketed ROM as well as the VGA RAM with a screwdriver and pressing it in again so probably there was some corroded contact. Anyway let's further tackle this 386 booting problem there. 62 and some epic data center server. I quickly rebuilt some more kernels within some minutes. And the oldest one I built uh, actually booted on the first try. Um, of course it also doesn't find the root of this here due to IDE. Maybe this happens not to be included in the kernel right now. Also very helpful, a nice metal top technical drawing pen that you can press the reset comfortably. Let's try the next best kernel. Yes, CMOS battery we still need to solder. So we boot without init RD. We don't really need this if we have it fully working later. So I just booted 2624. So let's try 26. It was actually also helpful in another way that I played here with the 386 because I found the SGI keyboard may have some malfunction. I noticed on the SGI it would sometimes hang for a second. I already thought this is an SGI problem, but it also hangs on the 386, so luckily it looks like only this old fashioned keyboard has some strange irritation. Maybe it's related to this 2 meter long cable. As it happens on the 386 it looks like maybe it's not an SGI issue and the SGI is totally fine after all. Anyway, so 226. I also already installed DOS. Actually I wasted quite a bit of extra time reinstalling DOS seven times until I figured out the limit of the IDE. The BIOS appears not to be able to load more than 400 something megabyte, like not load but address with this um, cylinder head sector thing. It does not appear to be 504 megabyte or was a limit of some early BIOSes in the 90s. My limit appears to be somehow smaller than this because initially I had 64 megabyte Linux and then 400 something DOS and this already was not working so right now I have a really small DOS partition, 100 megabyte or something. And also the boot partition I have now only 16 or 32 megabyte or something for my kernels. This 26 also works. So somewhere after this is at least the first regression and then there must be another regression and maybe a third somewhere. Anyway, let's try to get this fully booted before we move on with something new another day. So the question is will it boot? I found the last kernel working without regression was 2627 and I also had to recompile it to add IDE support because they renamed the configuration symbol name and we have Linux booting. Because this old kernel does not include the dev temp fs that we are currently using usually by default. I did a quick hack. Why is this? Should this be? Because maybe I can ignore it. Um, yeah, mount time in the future. Thank you very much. Now it's really checking. I thought I set a reasonable date. Okay, maybe I set it to 2016 instead of 2018. That's of course unfortunate. Anyway, we have the user 
land running. And now I wonder, did it activate swap already before checking the file system? The question is, is this hopefully in read only mode and I can just reset or should we let it run? Anyway, as a quick hack, in QEMO I booted the hard disk with a slightly newer kernel and simply copied all the old-fashioned device names as real on file system device nodes onto the actual hard disk so that this kernel would work without a dev tempfs mounted and as I also did not bother downgrading udev to work with the old glibc and such. It's a little bit unfortunate that we now have file system check running. This is actually exactly what I did not want it on this old hardware though. Okay, I pulled the reset pin. It was too boring to wait for the file system check. Also, I can easily replicate it. So I was curious what happens if I reset in the middle of the file system check. So this is expected. Our init system is trying to create some files before bringing UDF. Unbelievable. Now I have the right time, but the old boot already marked the last time permanently in the file system. It's of course unfortunate. Okay, now then I wait again for the boot check to finish. The file system test actually finished. I'm impressed and surprised that it runs through with only 8 megabyte of memory. But then it's also this annoying that the system wants to boot them. Finally passed the file system check. Let's see if we will manage to the login prompt. Okay. I have the feeling the spark station fell slightly faster. But that's only feeling. But well, actually, I really think the spark station fell faster, and that's even text modus graphic because the newer kernel would not even boot, and I reduced the memory use more and more, and I even disabled frame buffer and frame buffer console. So, an unknown CPU family 3, 386, with FPU and 4.8 Bogomips. Free memory wise, 6 totally usable, and uh, Actually use 2.5, 3, 3.5, obviously extremely little. I'm really surprised this file system check runs through without crashing. This is, by the way, what I meant this D-mask was hanging. Um, maybe this was seeable here. I think this really was what I meant. <clears throat> of course, right now it doesn't hang, but it really looks like this keyboard has some irritations or it's interference on the super long cable. I don't know what. Anyway, scrolling is of course faster, but surprisingly not that fast considering that this is text mode scrolling. Here, CPU. No, right now it was hanging again, so I need another keyboard. Yeah, this PCI really shows nothing. Cannot open bus PCI. Obviously, we have no PCI. Interrupts XT picks with this cascaded 81. So this is really old-fashioned I.O. ports, DMA, PIC, Timer, Keyboard, CMOS, IDE Generic, VGA+. Mission accomplished. It's not the very latest kernel because this has too many regressions. Maybe the next fun thing for the future, somewhere between now and forever, getting the last kernel where the code was included, working, fixing regressions on the way, that will be plenty of <clears throat> time wasting fun. However, what I will probably do first is I had somewhere here a sound blaster. So next I will test this on Linux. This is by the way a either plug and play and also from what the Creative DOS drivers showed an AWE. AWE? Hmm. How do you want to pronounce this nicely? Anyway, um, this is one of those ISA plug and play cards that is using this ISA configuration port magic to configure the resources instead of jumpers because I'm really curious if this system will be fast enough to play this lossless flag files uh, the SGI consume 5 or 10% uh, I need to check and also theoretically an either card this is also ready I can play I don't see jumpers there is actually jumpers not soldered in anyway this will be the next fun thing to plug in the Sound Blaster and the NE2000 and try to connect to the internet as well as try to play a flag file. I hope you enjoyed this adventure and don't forget to subscribe for all the next videos to come.